Today we're going to look at the digestive system. We are going to break this up into multiple parts since this is another really long system to go through. So with the digestive system, it's sometimes called the gastrointestinal system. The terms can be used interchangeably. I don't mind which one you use in my class, whichever one is fine. So this is going to involve your alimentary canal. This is basically how you get in food and nutrients and one of the means of removing waste. It's going to involve the mouth, most of the pharynx, the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, and then the exit points, the anus. So this is going to be doing a lot of the disassembly. You're going to take in food and then you're going to disassemble it to get down to the molecular components of it. So it's got some accessory organs that go with it. These would be your teeth, the tongue, salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, pancreas are all going to be accessory organs. So this is just a nice kind of composite picture here that shows where all of them are superimposed on a body. So you know where they are underneath. And here is one of an abdomen with this tissue pulled back so you can see all the way down to the organs. So the functions of the digestive system could include ingestion. This is taking things in, secretion of water, acid, buffers and enzymes into the lumen. These are going to be used for breaking things down for digestion. You have mixing and propulsion. So you have to stir these juices as well as propel them down through the digestive system. Digestion is both a mechanical and chemical process. You have physically churning up the food as well as hydrolysis where you're going to break chemical bonds. Most of them are going to be broken down by adding water and then you're going to absorb things and it will get absorbed either into the bloodstream or the lymphatics. And finally, when you're done, there's defecation at the end where you're going to remove the waste. So again, this is a nice little overview picture here showing food coming in, beginning with your mechanical ingestion, chewing, churning, the different segments as you go along. Propulsion is going to move things through here, starting in the stomach. You do a lot more chemical digestion, adding liquids to it as you go along into the small intestine, absorption into the lymphatics in the bloodstream and then large intestine, and then where you form the feces and eliminate it. So it's just a nice little overview picture of what goes along along the way. And this stops and breaks down a few more details in for the different organs as you go with it being superimposed on a body. So what's going on with the oral cavity in there, your mechanical processing, you've got salivary glands that are going to produce enzymes to help break things down and lubricate things, the pharynx to help start propel things into the esophagus. The esophagus is a big tube that's going to transport things down to the stomach. The liver is going to secrete bile and various other things in there. The liver's got a huge number of functions. Gallbladder going to produce bile, pancreas producing several other digestive enzymes going into the small intestine and then the large intestine and finally out the anus. So when we look at the layers of the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, there are the same four layers that go all the way down. They're just going to vary a little bit as you go down. So the mucosa is the innermost lining. You would have the epithelium that provides protection, secretion and absorption. The lamina propria is going to be the connective tissue that's going to have blood and lymphatic vessels in there as well as your mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. The muscularis mucosae is a thin layer of smooth muscle. It's going to make folds. This helps to increase the surface area. And then the submucosa, you have connective tissue that's going to bind the mucosa to the muscularis. Here you're going to find a lot of the blood and lymphatic vessels as well as the submucosal plexus. And then the muscularis, it's the inner circular fibers and outer longitudinal fibers. So there is voluntary skeletal muscle found in the mouth and the pharynx and the upper two thirds of the esophagus, as well as one of the anal sphincters. Most of the tube though is going to have involuntary smooth muscle. So once you've made the choice to swallow something, 
it's pretty much involuntary and then you get some choice in when to eliminate it. Again, with some of these where you have voluntary control, um, if you don't take advantage of the voluntary control in a timely fashion, it may handle it involuntarily for you. So you'll have the myenteric plexus between the muscle layers. And then the serosa, which is also your visceral peritoneum, it's the outermost coverings of the organs. This is going to be on any of the organs suspended in the abdominal pelvic category, except the esophagus. It lacks serosa and has adventitia instead. So this is showing the different layers as you go out. So the innervation of the nervous system, we sometimes refer to this as your enteric nervous system. It's the brain gut or the set of intrinsic nerves that are stimulated as food passes through. So the neurons are going to go from the esophagus down to the anus. There's two plexuses, a myenteric plexus that's going to promote gastrointestinal tract motility and the submucosal plexus that's going to include controlling the secretions. So a short reflex is one that involves direct stimulation of a postganglionic fiber by the sensory neuron. The long reflex is going to involve integration into the spinal cord or brain. So the big difference is the long reflexes are going to include the CNS. So the autonomic nervous system is that extrin extrinsic set of nerves where you have the parasympathetic mode is going to stimulate the enteric nervous system. It's going to increase secretion and activity. The sympathetics are going to inhibit the enteric nervous system. So under the fight or flight mode, it does not want to work well. So you'll have decreased secretion and activity. And this is just showing here where you've got CNS that's going to come in and influence these two. You've got the myenteric and the submucosal longitudinal and circular smooth muscle layers of the muscularis being involved and then your mucosal epithelium. So it just kind of visually maps out the relationship. So movement in the digestive system, the visceral smooth muscle is going to have these rhythmic cycles of activities. You actually have little pace setter cells that will undergo spontaneous depolarization. This is so that you can have peristalsis, which is going to be a wave-like movement that's going to move the bolus of food matter. It's a rhythmic contraction of longitudinal muscles. So if you've ever watched a snake eat a mouse or a rodent, you'll notice that its body kind of squeezes things down. We're essentially doing the same thing, but we fold up our digestive system and stick it in the middle of our body. Theirs runs the length of their body. So we have segmentation in there, and so this is going to help us to churn and fragment a bolus, and this is going to involve contraction of the circular muscle. So peristalsis is the wave-like contraction. Segmentation moves things through contraction of circular muscles. So what's going to control movement of stuff in the digestive system? We have neural mechanisms. So particularly the parasympathetic and local reflexes. And then we have hormonal mechanisms. These will enhance or inhibit the smooth muscle contraction. And then the local mechanisms help to coordinate the responses with changes in the pH or local stimuli. So the digestive system has several sphincters. Sphincters are just ring-like muscles that are going to constrict off and separate different areas. So you have the upper esophageal sphincter or inferior pharyngeal sphincter. This is located at the distal pharynx. This is going to protect the esophagus. So this is the one that is involved in burping air. And one of the things that can happen if this malfunctions is GERD, the gastroesophageal reflux disease. That is where acid starts coming back up. That is not something we want to have happen. 
the lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter is at the bottom of the esophagus before you enter into the stomach. So this one is going to try and prevent acid from coming back up. Malfunction of this can cause GERD as well. You really do want to keep the acid out of the esophagus. There is evidence suggesting that it is associated with increased risk of esophageal cancer if you have chronic acid reaching up into there. So the pyloric sphincter is between the stomach and the duodenum. The sphincter of Audi, this is going to be where the common bile duct and pancreatic duct connect to the duodenum. The ileocecal sphincter is between the small and large intestine. And then the anal sphincter, it's at the distal end of the rectum and you actually have an internal and external portion of this. The internal is involuntary, the external is voluntary. So if this malfunctions, you can have fecal incontinence. So we have a series of membranes dividing things up in the digestive system. So the peritoneum is the largest serous membrane of the body. It's going to be divided into your parietal peritoneum that lines the wall of the cavity and the visceral peritoneum that's going to cover the organs. So it's also sometimes referred to as the serosa and the space between these membranes is the peritoneal cavity. So it folds quite a bit in the gastrointestinal system. We've got five major peritoneal folds, the greater omentum, the falciform ligament, lesser omentum, mesentery, and mesocolon. So the mesentery has actually been classified as an organ now, and they will weave between the viscera and help bind the organs together. So if you've had abdominal surgery, sometimes it may take a while for the gastrointestinal system to start having things move through again because some of that stuff does get shifted around in there and it takes a while for it to kind of resettle back into place. So here is a mid-sagittal section that lets you see where some of these organs are. You'll notice here that this looks like there's all these little loops in here. That is cross sections of your small intestine in there, but this lets you see where you've got the mesentery, mesocolon, lesser omentum, greater omentum, where the different folds occur. And then this highlights some of them here. So you've got your greater omentum. This is almost like an apron that covers your abdominal organs. So that's why you don't see all of your abdominal organs moving and contracting all the time through so your abdomen is this is kind of a fatty apron that protects that. And it can be covered with additional layers as well of fat to help protect that. So then we have the lesser omentum up here, the falciform ligament, and the mesentery. So there's parts of the peritoneum, mesentery, mesocolon, lesser and greater omentum. So peritonitis is inflammation of this. Some things that can happen in there, you can have trauma to the area. And when you have trauma to the area, it's always, the damage is always unique to what happened with that specific trauma. But it can lead to rupture of the gastrointestinal tract. Appendicitis or even something like a perforated ulcer can be a problem. Given the nature of the gastrointestinal tract with high levels of bacteria, trauma is always very risky in there, high potential for infection. So this again is showing more of these folds in here, the peritoneal folds, mesentery, mesocolon, greater omentum, falciform ligament, greater omentum again. I'm showing the lesser omentum here. Okay. 
So the mouth is where things start. It's sometimes referred to as your oral or buccal cavity. It's formed by the cheeks, the hard and soft palate, and the tongue. So the oral cavity proper is going to extend from the gum and teeth to the fauces, which is the opening between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx. Your salivary glands are going to release saliva. Normally it's just enough to keep the mouth and pharynx moist and clean. When food enters the mouth, secretion is going to increase to help lubricate, dissolve, begin chemical digestion. So if sometimes you feel like when you look at certain foods or you smell certain foods that you start to salivate, you're not imagining it. It does happen anticipating you getting ready to eat. We have three major salivary glands that secrete most of the saliva, the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. So the oral cavity is going to provide sensory analysis of the material before you swallow it. So it's a way of you checking out going, what is this? Do I want to swallow it? You're going to begin the mechanical processing. You're going to use your teeth, your tongue, and the palatal surfaces to chew things up. It helps to lubricate it with the mucus and the salivary glands. And you actually have a little bit of digestion of the carbohydrates and lipids in here. It's certainly not complete digestion. So those three pairs of salivary glands, you can see them in here. The sublingual glands, the submandibular, and the parotid glands. So the parotid glands are up higher in the cheeks, closer to the ears. And then you can see the little tubes that are going to drop the liquid in. And here is an up close image of a salivary duct. So saliva is mostly water. It helps to wet the food so that it's easier to swallow. It helps to dissolve it for more tasting in there. It's 0.5% solutes. So these would include ions, some dissolved gases, urea, uric acid, mucus, IgA, that secretory IgA for protecting the mucous membranes, lysozyme, and salivary amylase. The amylase acts on amylose starch. You have some chloride ions to help activate the amylase. So you can have some phosphate and bicarbonate ions to help buffer bacterial acids. So immune protection in there with IgA, lysozyme, and cyanide, and defensins. Not all salivary glands produce the same type of saliva. So this is autonomic and controlled. Parasympathetic will promote secretion of moderate amounts of saliva, where sympathetic stimulation will decrease the salivation. So saliva composition is different in different animals. We eat different things. Um, if you have a dog, they love to lick your plate after you've eaten. One of the things you'll notice the saliva of theirs, theirs is much more sticky than ours. That you can't just rinse it off the plate. It actually kind of has to be scrubbed off the plate because they have a different composition of saliva than humans. So with the tongue and teeth, the tongue is an accessory digestive organ. It is skeletal muscle and then it's covered with mucous membranes. It's going to help to maneuver the food for chewing, help to shape the mass and force it back for swallowing. So if you've had dental work done where your tongue is numb, you'll notice you're not real great at that coordinating those activities for swallowing. Yes, you probably still can swallow, but you're not going to have good feedback of exactly where your tongue is. So speech may sound a little bit different. You're a lot more likely to bite your tongue, which is why they don't recommend you eat when your mouth is numb. So the lingual glands secrete the salivary lipase. So that lipase will help break down a little bit of lipid. That helps keep you from having a fatty film in your mouth after you've eaten something that contains a lot of fat. It also is going to give more sensory analysis, touch, temperature, taste receptors. So for some people, the textures of food is a big deal. 
So your teeth or dentes are another accessory digestive organ. There's three major regions to a tooth, the crown, the root, and the neck. The dentin of the crown is covered by enamel. So as humans, we have two dentitions. You get your baby teeth, which are your deciduous teeth, like a deciduous leaf, you lose them. Permanent teeth, you get to keep these, or hopefully you get to keep them. Those are the ones you have into adulthood. So the periodontal ligament is going to attach the tooth to the alveolar bone. So when we look at the tongue, the terminal sulcus is the groove that's going to divide the tongue into the anterior two thirds and the posterior one thirds. So you can see this division here. The tongue looks different on the anterior two thirds versus the posterior two thirds. So in the anterior region, it's in the oral cavity. It's got these papillae on it and you can see the papillae here. Some of them have taste buds. And then in the back, you've got no papillae, but you've got abundant lymphoid tissue in there for your lingual tonsils. So with these taste buds, they do taste different things better in different regions of the mouth as well. So your typical tooth is an example here. So when we think of teeth, what we think of what we normally see is this enamel portion. But what we see in our mouth is actually really just a small part of the tooth. It goes down quite a ways below. So when you lost baby teeth, they were probably pretty little and it was probably a long time ago for you. So you may not remember much about the teeth, but if you've had to have any teeth removed as an adult, you'll notice that they are quite a bit bigger. They go down further in there. If you have to have a root canal done and you feel like they're just drilling and drilling and drilling, you realize how oh, this tooth is a little bit bigger than I was expecting. So digestion in the mouth is mechanical and chemical. Mechanical because you're going to chew, which is also called mastication and you're going to mix things up with the saliva to form a bolus. Chemical digestion, you've got the salivary amylase for the starches. Only monosaccharides can be absorbed here, so not a lot is absorbed. And they'll continue to act until they're inactivated by the stomach acid. The lingual lipase will help with starting to break down the triglycerides. And then the rest of things will become activated in the acidic environment of the stomach. So the pharynx is a funnel shaped tube that extends from the internal nares to the esophagus. So this is the area kind of behind the lower end of the nasal cavity that's going to grab and connect the nasal cavity and the oral cavity in there. So to go internal nares to the esophagus on the posterior end and the larynx on the anterior end. So you've got skeletal muscle lined with mucous membranes here. Swallowing or deglutition is facilitated by the saliva and the mucus. So if you've tried to swallow something when your mouth is really dry, you'll notice that, that process doesn't work as well without things being lubricated. So this process starts when the bolus gets pushed into the oral pharynx. It's going to send sensory nerve signals down to the deglutition center in the brain stem. Soft palate is lifted. That's going to close off the nasopharynx. So we don't want to have food going back up through the nose. Occasionally, if somebody coughs or sneezes or is choking, food may end up going into that area when it's in there and it shouldn't have been when there's all that extra force to try and remove things. So the larynx is lifted as the epiglottis is bent down to cover the glottis. So there's three parts of this cavity, the nasopharynx that we talked about in the respiratory system. That's where all of its functions are. The oropharynx and laryngopharynx are going to serve both the digestive and respiratory systems. So the esophagus 
when we look at the tissues of it, you've got the mucosa. It's a sharp transition from non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar epithelium. Enzymes are not produced here and there is no absorption. It's essentially a transport tube. The esophageal epithelium is resistant to abrasion, but not to acid. So that's why we want to keep stomach acid out of this disease, this area. Proteolytic enzyme attack can lead to acid reflux disease. So it's not going to feel good when acid gets in the area. Sometimes it can be blatant discomfort for a person, but sometimes it can be more subtle where when they lay on their back, they'll actually just cough. And that can be one of the signs of having acid reflux is some coughing. The submucosa is going to have your large mucous glands, then the muscularis portion. The upper one third is skeletal muscle, so you have conscious control over that. The middle is mixed, and then the lower one third is all smooth. So you have upper and lower esophageal sphincters, and they are your prominent circular muscles. And then the adventitia is connective tissue that's going to blend with the surrounding connective tissue. There's no peritoneum here. This is the part that had the adventitia. So with swallowing, it's going to be facilitated with secretions of the saliva and mucus. So there is going to be three stages. It's going to occur in the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus. So the voluntary stage here, the bolus is passed to the oral pharynx. In the pharyngeal phase, you're going to have involuntary passage through the pharynx into the esophagus. And then with the esophageal phase, you have involuntary passage through the esophagus to the stomach. And peristalsis is going to push that bolus forward. So you can see the bolus here going in with the tongue. You can see the tongue comes up and pushes back to help push it down into the throat. So you position it and then here is your pharyngeal phase of swallowing. And then in the esophagus, you can see these circular muscles contract, pushing it down into the stomach. So deglutition is moving that bolus from the mouth to the stomach. So in the pre-oral phase, this starts with the anticipation of food being introduced into the mouth. So you look at that big plate of bacon or that nice chocolate bar, whatever is your thing in there. It's going to have salivation be triggered. Sight of smell of food is all it takes, as well as hunger. So in the buccal or oral phase, this is voluntary. You're going to move the bolus to the oral pharynx. During the pharyngeal phase, this is now involuntary. So receptors in the oral pharynx stimulate, stimulate the medulla and pons to help block the mouth with the tongue, block the nasopharynx with the soft palate, raise the larynx to seal off the epiglottis and block the airways, and then relax the upper esophageal sphincter for things to be able to move in. So here you can see the bolus moving down. So here is where you block off the airway. You do not want this bolus getting into the trachea. So here is the epiglottis blocking things off. and then into the esophageal phase. So the upper esophageal sphincter closes, the gastroesophageal sphincter opens, and the esophagus is going to control the involuntary peristaltic movement, continuing to move that bolus down. So when it gets into the stomach, the stomach is going to serve as a mixing chamber and holding reservoir. There's four main regions of the stomach. So the cardia is up at the top, so that's closest to the heart. You've got the fundus, which is going to be this peak area here, the belly, and the pylorus is going to be the distal end. So here you can see gastroesophageal sphincter is closed. Here it opens up to allow things into the stomach. So again, you've got those four layers. The mucosa, here you're going to have gastric glands that open into gastric pits. 
and we have different types of cells here because we're going to change the chemical composition of what we're dealing with. So we have three types of exocrine glands, mucus neck cells that produce mucus, parietal cells that will produce intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid, and chief cells that are going to make pepsinogen and gastric lipase. So we have G cells that are an endocrine cell in the pylorus. They're going to secrete the hormones gastrin that is going to help to regulate acid secretion during and after meals. The D cells are also another endocrine cell in the pylorus. They're going to release somatostatin that is going to inhibit the release of gastrin. And then in the sub, you've got the submucosa. The muscularis is an additional third inner oblique layer and the serosa part of the visceral peritoneum. So when you look at this picture here, it shows that you've got these three different layers of muscle, longitudinal, circular, and oblique layers here. This is going to allow the stomach to contract in all different directions. So that makes it more effective for squeezing. So here you can see this highlights where the fundus is, the cardia, the top portion, the pylorus. In here, you can see these rugae, these internal folds or gastric rugae inside of the stomach. So when we enlarge it to look at the histology more, here you can see where the gastric pits are in here in the mucosa, but you can see the texture of this. You've got some lymphatic nodules in here, lymphatic vessels, blood vessels, and then the different layers of the muscle. And then a microscopic picture here. These are your gastric pits. And then we would have some chief cells and parietal cells. So again, digestion is both mechanical and chemical here. Mechanical with the mixing waves, the peristaltic movement to create chyme. Chemical digestion, the salivary amylase will continue until it's inactivated by things becoming acidic. The acid gastric juices will activate the lingual lipase and this will help start digesting triglycerides into fatty acids and some diglycerides. The parietal cells are going to secrete acid and chlor the chloride ion separately, but the net effect is that you make hydrochloric acid. This is important because it's going to kill a lot of microbes. It also starts to denature a lot of proteins for the digestive process. Pepsin is going to be secreted by the chief cells. This is going to digest proteins and this will be secreted as pepsinogen. So when you see this gen on there, it generally is going to tell you it generates something, generates pepsin. The gastric lipase will split the triglycerides into your fatty acids and monoglycerides. There is a little bit of nutrient absorption here, but that's not the primary thing. Some water ions, short chain fatty acids, and certain drugs can be absorbed a little bit here. So alcohol a little bit in the stomach as well. So the stomach contents are going to become more fluid and the pH will approach the pH of two, which is very acidic. That's going to increase pepsin activity and you'll start to disassemble proteins. Intrinsic factor here is secreted by the parietal cells. This is needed to absorb vitamin B12. Without this, a person would develop pernicious anemia. So gastric inhibitory peptide the main effect of this is to stimulate insulin secretion after a meal. They used to think it was to inhibit acid secretion, but that's not its main job. It just tends to occur at the same time. So when we look at regulating gastric activity, the cephalic phase prepares the stomach to reduce, receive the ingested material. 
The gastric phase is going to start when the food actually arrives. And then you have neural and hormonal responses. So your intestinal phase is going to control the rate of gastric emptying. So here we look with the cephalic phase. You've got the sight, smell, taste, thoughts of food. Central nervous system gets things going. You prepare the stomach for arrival of food. This is relatively short. So you're going to have the vagus nerve start sending the message in there. So you're going to stimulate mucus, enzymes, acid production, get those gastric juices going, and gastrins released by the G cells. When you move into the gastric phase, now you're going to enhance the secretion that was started. You'll help to homogenize and acidify the chyme, so get that mixed up more. Initiate digestion of proteins with pepsin. This phase is longer. It takes three to four hours. So you have your neural short reflexes get triggered here. So as your stomach starts to fill up and the chemoreceptors of things becoming acidic, you have the hormonal stimulation of gastrin from the G cells. This happens with your parasympathetic stimulation. And when you have peptides and amino acids in the chyme, and then you'll have local release of histamine by mast cells is the stomach fills. Here, what you're doing is increasing the acid and pepsinogen production, increasing the motility and the mixing waves. So lots of stirring things in during this phase. Then with the intestinal phase, this is going to control the rate the chyme goes into the duodenum. So this one can take several hours. So you've got short reflexes going in. These are going to be triggered by distension of the duodenum. Hormonal signals. So your primary stimulation of cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide, these are going to be secreted when you have the presence of acid, carbohydrates, and lipids. And then you'll have the release of gastrin from the undigested proteins and peptides. So here we get the feedback inhibition of the gastric acid pepsinogen production and reducing gastric motility. So things are getting ready to head on to the next step. So again, this is just summarizing those different phases here. This is just showing some of those secretions that come in and out of the stomach. So a lot of the acid blockers, like things like Tigamet or Zantac, are going to block the acid and block the histamine. So sometimes those drugs actually get used for other things for their histamine blocking reactions in there. So sometimes they may be used if they're anticipating you having a strong allergic reaction to something. So then we have the intestinal phase here. This is again showing you some of these things that go on in there. It's in a ex short excitatory phase. The stretch receptors are going to play a part in here and chemoreceptors getting things going. So we have three reflexes in here that are going to happen. You've got your inhibitory enterogastric reflex. You have stretch receptors and chemoreceptors that trigger things to inhibit the vasovagal reflex, inhibit the myenteric reflex, and activate the sympathetic nervous system to close the pyloric sphincter. That's going to inhibit gastric secretion. So you'll have enterogastrone secretion and enteroendocrine cells that are going to 
cause the release of cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide, and secretin. And then the vasoactive intestinal peptide is going to be a hormone that is going to inhibit gastric secretion as well. So we have to have a way of shutting down all these secretions when we're getting ready to get the food out of the stomach is essentially what's happening. So food normally passes through the stomach in about four hours. So you will feel fuller earlier in that time, but as things start to leave, you may start to feel a little more hungry in there as well, just the, from the physical emptiness of it. Hunger is both, has aspects of physically having food in the space, but as well as signals of what's going on with your blood sugar. So hormonal and neuronal reflexes regulate that. So alcohol, large meals, low protein content, and large amount of liquid can increase the stomach distension and can increase the rate of emptying. So stomach emptying inhibited by the enterogastric reflex, the enterogastrones, and fat in the duodenum. So a little bit of fat in the meal will actually slow things down moving through the stomach. So this is just another picture here that's showing all of these feedback mechanisms, your duodenal endocrine cells secreting enterogastrones, like secreting CCP, VIP, chemoreceptors and stretch receptors, your long and short reflexes, all these things sending messages to the stomach, and then the duodenal stimuli will decline to shut things down. So you've got the negative feedback loop going on in there. So this is another picture that is kind of nice because it's going to show things that stimulate versus inhibit things in the stomach and it points to it going in at different phases in there so you can see what's going on in the cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phase. It's all things that have been talked about earlier but it just kind of summarizes it in a nice picture. And that's where we're going to stop this section. We'll pick up again to look at more in the next video.